our friends who are watching on uh, television, on uh, either satellite or they're watching on the internet, uh, whatever it might be, we're very glad that you're joining us here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church. We're continuing a series that is dealing with the subject of Jesus in all the Bible. And I expect there'll, there'll be maybe, we're on 11 today. I think there will maybe be one or two more, maybe 20 more, but no, I think one or two more. I could just go on because I see I have Jesus sightings all the time when I'm reading the Bible. Uh, even Christ said, in the volume of the book it is written of me, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So when I embarked on this series, I kind of in my mind, I had some of the great characters in the Bible and show how they are types of Christ and I just kept seeing more and more and more and I thought, I gotta bring this to an end or I'll be having you gather together in the New Jerusalem to hear the rest of the story. So, uh, but you know, it works out well today because our topic today is dealing with Joshua, Jesus and all the Bible. This is actually installment number 11 and I thought how appropriate that we're gonna be talking about a faithful soldier on Memorial Weekend. And we are so thankful for those in our country that have put their lives on the line to defend the freedoms that we enjoy in worship. Can you say amen? amen. We sure appreciate uh, the many who have sacrificed um, to make it possible for us to have that freedom. Well, how many of you know who was the first person to circumnavigate the globe? Surprised you, didn't I? Who was the first person to circumnavigate the globe? Noah. I don't know what route he took, but that's a good, a clever answer. Yeah, I didn't expect that. We don't know. I don't think he had a sail or a motor. He may have, but that would have been quite a bit of floating. But I, any of you graduate fifth grade? All right, someone said Magellan. Correct, but not correct. It was Magellan's party that was the first to circumnavigate the globe. In 1519, five ships with 270 men embarked. They were going to the Spice Islands, and they understood at that point that the world was round, and they thought it'd be a lot quicker to come back around the back way. Magellan is the one who named the Pacific Ocean, but it wasn't that Pacific, they found out later and as well as Tierra del Fuego and other things, but Magellan himself did not make it all the way around the world. He got into some little dispute in the Philippines and was killed in a skirmish. The one who actually made it from start to finish, out of the 270 men that started, only 18 finished. Out of the five ships, only one came limping back full of worms and leaking. The men who did finally get back uh, they, they looked like POW refugees. Uh, they had suffered from scurvy and war and starvation, but they were very wealthy because they did manage to bring back a shipload of spices that were worth as much as gold. But the one who made it was actually his navigator, Juan Sebastian Elcano. Now, when you think about Moses leading the children of Israel into the promised land, you realize Moses didn't make it. Moses led them most of the way and he led them out, but he did not lead them in. The one who saw all of the wonders in Egypt and lived all the way through the settlement into the promised land was not Moses, it was Joshua. And Joshua is going to be our subject this morning. He is, you might say, a neglected hero in the Bible. For one thing, you probably already know this, I've said it many times, Joshua's name, if you weren't looking for how is Joshua like Christ, well, his name is the same. The name Joshua is, we're used to saying the more Hebrew-like pronunciation, more literally, we believe it's Yeshua. Um, and, you know, in English we say Joshua. Uh, we say Jesus' name based on more of a Greek and a Latin, Jesu, uh, Spanish, Jesus. You know, in every language, names are sometimes a little different. We got a boy named George, but in Spanish it's Orge. You know what I'm saying. So every language is different. Some people have made a religion now about saying you must pronounce Jesus' name in its original Hebrew. 
Have you run into these people? They're, they're the Yahweh only people. And they think if you say it any other way that somehow that's irreverent. I think frankly that's silly. From the Tower of Babel, God cursed the tongues and we all speak in our tongues. And when the Lord spoke to different people through angels, he would speak to them in their native tongue. And you know, as I travel around the world, I find some people cannot say my name the way I say my name. I don't rebuke them. When I worked with the Navajos, they could not say Doug. When I first told them my name, they laughed. I thought, why? They said, oh, we never had a pastor named Duck. I said, no, it's, it's not Duck, it's Doug. Ha ha, Duck. <laughs> I said, no, and I go some places and it's Dog. And you would be surprised, you really would, how many people spell my name D-O-U-G-H, which is Doe. But I smile, I'm not offended. And if we say Jesus' name, then if you're calling him Jesus and you're in Spanish, or uh, Jesus if we're in English, he hears your prayers, friends, amen? That's what it says, praying in his name. It's talking about in the spirit of Christ. Anyway, so he has the same name. That name is found, Joshua is found 222 times in the Bible. The word Joshua in Jesus means Jehovah is Savior. You remember when the angel said to Mary, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Notice that, not in their sins. You can come to him in your sins, but he wants to save you from your sins. Amen? And he's the great successor of Moses and the leader of Israel. You might say he was the first Hebrew general. He was a great soldier. And we're going to get to that in just a moment here. A, a little um, interesting fact. It says here in Numbers 13, verse 16, and Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. So he also is called Hoshea in the Bible, but Moses called him Joshua. Kind of altered his name a little bit. That often happens in the Bible. Abraham becomes Abram and Jesus named Simon Peter, and so forth. Um, one other interesting fact about Joshua, it says Joshua is the son of Nun, and you can trace the genealogy, you've got it there in Chronicles, you can trace the genealogy of Joshua, he is from who knows what tribe? Ephraim. He's from the tribe of Ephraim. Caleb was from the tribe of Judah. But you can trace the genealogy all the way from Ephraim to Nun, to Joshua. It's interesting, Joshua is the son of Nun. You think everyone's a son of somebody, right? But it never talks about any genealogy after Joshua. It never mentions, if I say, who is Moses' wife? We have at least one wife named Zipporah. Some wonder if the other Ethiopian is still Zipporah, um, but we know her name. Do you ever hear any mention of Joshua's wife or any of Joshua's children? We know Samuel was married and had children. It names them. It's interesting. Who is Jesus married to? The church is his bride. Now, he may have been married. I'm just telling you it's not mentioned in the Bible. Uh, how many of you have been to the Mojave Desert? They got a tree there. and What's it called? The Joshua Tree. You know, it got its name in 1844. I thought as Adventists you'd find that interesting. When Mormons were going through the Mojave Desert and they saw these trees with their arms stretched out and they said it looked like Joshua guiding the children of Israel through the deserts, the wilderness. And so, hence the name. And some of them are a thousand years old. Well, there's a couple that are a thousand years old, some 500 years old. But uh, yeah, they're very ancient trees and they're, they're protected now. Joshua, now I've got about 10 points for anyone that's keeping track. Joshua was, of course, among other things, a fearless soldier. He was the first general of Israel. And you find him appearing in Exodus 17, verse 9, when the children of Israel first came out of Egypt, as they were making, you know, they celebrated when the Egyptians were all drowned and Miriam led the ladies in song and they said the horse and rider was thrown into the sea. Israel didn't really fight in that battle. But after they began to migrate towards the mountain of the Lord, it says that there is this fierce, warlike people called the Amalekites. Uh, they descended from Amalek. Uh, they were loosely related to the Jews through Abraham, through his wife's, wife Keturah and, and their children. They ended up staying in the desert. They were warlike people. They were raiders. 
and they began to attack the children of Israel from behind. And you know, usually the weaker ones and the slower ones are in the back. And so they were attacking the ones who were on the fringes. And Moses said to Joshua, this is where he's first mentioned, assemble the men. Well, let me read it to you here. It's in Exodus chapter 17, verse 9. Moses said to Joshua, choose out some men, go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Now the Israelites, unless they spoiled the Egyptians and took some weapons with them, they were slaves, not soldiers. So Joshua had to choose out. He had to handpick some people that were able to fight. How did Moses come to pick Joshua? The Bible doesn't tell us, but some speculate when the plagues were falling and Moses was communicating with Pharaoh, you'll see several cases where Moses is using some messenger to send messages to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is sending messages. They're not using texting, and they're not using email. Somebody was running back and forth, and we think that back during that time that Moses had found that Joshua was a faithful man that he could use as a messenger. He seemed to be strong and courageous, and so he handpicks Joshua. Joshua, it calls him a young man because you weren't really considered an old man until you were 50 among the Jews. Keep in mind, Moses lived to 120. So Joshua was probably in his 40s. He's still fighting age, but the other young soldiers would respect him. He handpicked uh, young men that could go out in the battle, and they went and fought with Amalek. And as long as Moses had his hands lifted up, they won. I shared this with you before. When Moses got tired and his hands went down, they lost. So along came Aaron and Hur. They held up the hands of Moses and they defeated Amalek. Now the Amalekites were cursed that day and God said he would destroy the name of Amalek. Uh, you can tell when Saul, God told Saul to go and wipe out Amalek. It's hundreds of years later. But he didn't completely wipe them out because you even get into the book of Esther and it talks about uh, Haman, who is an Agagite. Agag was the king of the Amalekites. The Amalekites were still trying to destroy the Jews, even when you get to the book of Esther. So they were just long-standing enemies. Joshua led the first battle against them. You can see he's got a servant's heart. You read here in Exodus 24, so Moses arose with his assistant. This is Exodus 24:13. He arose with his assistant, Joshua. So right away, he's the apprentice, he's the assistant of Moses. Now, Moses could have suspected right there from the beginning that at some point Joshua would replace him, which he ultimately does. There was an apprentice prophet that was chosen for Elijah. His name was Elisha. Elisha followed Elijah around. He learned from observation, and then he took his place. Did Jesus have people that followed him around that he discipled? to do his work when he was gone. And so, you know, here, this is what Moses did. He's training him. They say one of the best things in leadership is to be training your replacement. Be looking around and training your replacement right away. And that's a sign of good leadership. Sign of good pastoring is that you impart knowledge and disciple others that the work goes on. Tells us that uh, Moses took Joshua up the mountain with him. It says they went up to the mountain of God. Now this is a special privilege because you read that nobody was supposed to go near that mountain on threat of death, except Moses was allowed to go up and his assistant. So he went up the mountain. You'll notice that when the people made the golden calf, Joshua didn't know what was going out. He's so far up the mountain with Moses. So Joshua is part of the way up the mountain when Moses is getting the Ten Commandments, but he's not with the people. Because when Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, Joshua says, Moses, it sounds like there's a war in the camp. And Moses shook his head and he said, no, Joshua, he said, that's not the sound of those that shout for being overcome. They're not shouting victory. They're not crying about being overcome. It's the voice of those that sing I do hear. So Joshua is at least part of the way up the mountain with Moses, though probably not in the immediate presence of God. You know what that makes him? He's a mediator. That means he's between the people and God. Jesus is our mediator between the people and God. You can read in Numbers 11, verse 28. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of his choice men. It's calling him one of his choice men. Now, 
Mo Moses may have had some others among the elders that he was discipling, but Joshua held a premier position. He was pleased to serve. What is a name for Christ? One of the messianic titles for Jesus is my servant. Jesus said, I am among you as one that serves. So one of the ways you see that Joshua is Christ-like is he's happy to serve. He's a faithful servant. You know, before Joseph, who is the subject in our Sabbath school today, became a great leader, he had to become a great servant. If you want to be a great leader, you need to know how to be a good servant. So he goes up the mountain with Moses. And you go to the next section here. Joshua has a devoted heart. He is devo devoted to Jehovah. Jehovah's name is in his name. Joshua means Jehovah. Yah is Savior. Yahshua. You read in Exodus 33. Now this is a verse. Most people miss this. And all the people saw the cloudy pillars stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose and they worshiped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he turned again into the camp. Moses turned from the tabernacle. He goes back into the camp but notice this. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tabernacle. Would God we had more young men that didn't want to leave church too soon. Even after Moses left, Joshua thought, well, if he's not kicking me out, I'm staying here in the presence of God. He was devoted to God. He loved God. He wanted to be in the presence of God. He liked the things of God. And he ends up, you see that Joshua ends up being one of the most courageous leaders in the Bible. I think there's a connection with his courage and the time he spent with God. You read about Martin Luther, who had the courage to stand up for the word of God, even though he was a Catholic priest. He stood up against that whole system, the Pope himself, knowing that it, he would ultimately have a price on his head and the reason he had so much courage is he spent a lot of time in prayer. Karen and I are still reading this beautiful devotional book on prayer. It talks about Martin Luther saying, if I don't pray at least three hours a day, I don't get anything done. I think many of us are convicted we don't pray half an hour a day. But he was, Joshua had devotion. He wanted to abide in God's presence. And God was able to do great things through him. Something else you find is that he's also not only a devoted man, he's a faithful scout. Now, many of us know this story where Moses, before they enter the promised land, he picks 12 individuals. And you don't get the whole story until you go to Deuteronomy. Moses repeats it. In Deuteronomy, Moses says, the people came to him and said, send spies. We haven't had anybody been in the promised land since Joseph left. And since Jacob left, we don't know what's going on. Things have changed in the last 200 years. So we need to send spies. And every tribe sort of selected one, someone, and, and Moses approved these selections. And they sent these spies out. It's important for you to know that this was not God's idea at, in the beginning. When you read about it in Numbers there, it sounds like God's commanding it. Deuteronomy tells us God allowed it, but the people suggested it. So they send spies. Why did they need spies? God had given them the promised land, right? Well, it's not a bad idea to get reconnaissance. So like Thomas Jefferson, some of you know American history, Thomas Jefferson sent the Lewis and Clark expedition to go survey this land that they had just bought from Napoleon called the Louisiana Purchase, the biggest land purchase in history. And, well, it was that or Alaska, but we bought them both. I don't remember which one's bigger. Anyway, it just about doubled the size of the United States, but they didn't know what they bought. And the English were coming in from the coast and the Spanish were coming up from the south and Jefferson said, we need to make a trip across the country, an exploratory trip, bring back word, tell us what the, the country is like. We don't even know what we've got. Do you know that Thomas Jefferson fully believed there were woolly mastodons that lived in California, in the west? because um, they'd seen all these big bones and, and they were sure that uh, they had no idea what to expect. They'd never seen a prairie dog or a grizzly bear. And uh, they'd never seen the Great Plains. They said, go find out what the land is like. Bring back word again. 
I heard that the Lewis and Clark expedition, they spent a whole day catching a prairie dog so they could send it downriver to Thomas Jefferson. And the prairie dog survived the trip and it lived out its life. And you can see that stuffed prairie dog in the Smithsonian Museum. They spent a whole day, the whole, all 40 men trying to catch one prairie dog. Anyway, so they sent back vegetable specimens. This is what Moses did. He said, bring the fruit of the land. He wanted them to encourage everybody. But what happened is they picked some spies that didn't have much faith. And as they saw the obstacles, the big walls of Jericho and the giants in Hebron and all the warlike people that were up in the north and they had the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and I always like to say the termites and the gigabytes and, <laughs> and all these bites up there and they got scared and they came back and they said, oh yeah, the land is flowing with milk and honey. Two of them carried back a cluster of grapes so big it took two men to carry one cluster of grapes. And if the cluster was that big, imagine how big each grape was. They're like plums. And they said, the land to which you sent us to spy is a beautiful land and here's the fruit of it. That's because Caleb and Joshua were the first ones there. But then the other 10 men showed up and they gave the majority report. They said, oh, it's a land that eats up the inhabitants. They got the giants that live up there in Hebron and they got the walls of Jericho and they've got all these warlike nations and how can we ever do it? And the people got discouraged. And they said, oh, why did the Lord bring us out here? And everybody wanted to go back and quit, but not Joshua and Caleb. They gave a faithful report. You can read in Numbers 14, verse six. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh who were among those who had spied out the land when the people were mourning and saying let's pick another leader and go back. They spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel saying the land we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us then he will bring us into the land and give it to us. A land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord or fear the people of the land for there are bread. Their protection is departed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. All the congregation said, stone them with stones. Was Joshua threatened with stoning? Was Jesus threatened with stoning? He was, wasn't he? And just before they stoned Joshua, the Lord intervened and protected him. Before they stoned Jesus, God hid him. It says, now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle before all the children of Israel had scared the people. You read in Numbers 14, a curse was placed on all the unfaithful spies and the whole generation that did not believe. They were supposed to go into the promised land after Mount Sinai. But because there they, they believed the negative report. Don't, don't let me rush past this. Okay, I'll, since you insist, I'll stop. They said, the unfaithful spies, we are not able. Joshua and Caleb said, we are able. They were all church members. Ten of those leaders said, we are not able to overcome the enemy. Two of them said, we are. That is still the way it is today. People do not believe we are able to be overcomers. They'll talk about the grace of Jesus, but Jesus' name means he will save his people from their sins. We are able to get the victory over the enemy. Do not give all the glory to the devil and how he makes you fall. Give the glory to God. He is able to give you victory over whatever you're struggling against. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So we still have people believing the majority report. Well, we're not able. We're just going to keep on sinning. We'll just sin a little less than other people. God wants you to have victory in your life. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not teaching perfection in that, in that uh, aspect, but I hear too many people really making excuses for sin and glorifying the power of the enemy, and we don't spend enough time saying God can get us into the promised land. Did the children of Israel have battles going into the promised land? They did, and you'll have battles. But did they take possession? Yes, they did. And we can make it, friends. Amen? Well, they had to wander 40 years. But you read here in Numbers 14.30, they all died off except Caleb the son of Jephani and Joshua the son of Nun. All the rest, he said, you will not enter the land that I swore I would make you dwell in. 
but Joshua and Caleb would enter it. That means when the children of Israel entered the promised land, there were only two people that were over 60. That'll really cut down on your social security expense, won't it? <laughs> Medical costs. All the others died. But you know what else that means? Joshua and Caleb had faith. God said because of the unbelief, the nation had to wander. Joshua and Caleb said, well, the church has got problems. They didn't have faith. We're going to the promised land by ourselves. No, when they were forced back into the wilderness to wander, did Joshua and Caleb go with them? And Moses and Aaron and God. So sometimes God's people are wandering because of unbelief, but God is still with his people. Amen? So Joshua stayed with them, and praise God, Jesus stays with us. At the end of 40 years, God's worker, Moses, time came for him to die. God's worker might die, but God's work does not die. God told Moses very plainly, he said, I want you to take, this is Numbers 27, 18, take Joshua, the son of Nun, with you, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him, and set him before Eliezer, Aaron had died, this is the son of Aaron, set him before Eliezer, who is the high priest, and before all the congregation publicly commission him where everyone sees and inaugurate him in their sight invest him with authority lay your hands on him and he will receive an extra portion of the spirit and so Joshua is now basically commissioned to take charge Moses dies shortly after this in fact the last words you're going to read in Deuteronomy are clearly not written by Moses because it's written about Moses death and burial which Moses could not write about. But I did hear about one man who planned his own funeral and he attended it before he died. Normally it doesn't happen that way. So here, when they came out of Egypt, there was the death of the lamb. Now before they enter the promised land, there's the death of Moses. Deuteronomy 34, now Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom from Moses had laid his hands on him so the children of Israel heeded him and did as all the Lord commanded him he was spirit filled what does the word anointed or Christ mean to be anointed with the Holy Spirit Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost the Bible tells us Joshua is anointed with the Holy Spirit so he's Christ like in that respect and then when you get to chapter 1 and this was our this was our um, uh, scripture reading for today, but you might want to turn there. We've just gotten to the first chapter in Joshua. We're halfway through the sermon. Got a lot to go. I love this. In verse 6, I'll go back to verse 5. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Can you say amen to that verse? Amen. Paul quotes that verse. And Jesus said, I will not leave you and forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide an inheritance, the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. He's getting ready to fight seven nations, that you may observe to do all that the Lord Moses, my servant, commanded you to do. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left, that you may prosper. And that means be successful. How many want to be successful? Obey the law of the Lord. You'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that will not fade. Psalm 1. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you will meditate it day and night. Scripture based. Jesus is the living word. That you may observe to do all that's in it that is written. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. How does Jesus end Matthew chapter 28? Behold, I am with you wherever you go. So Joshua's commissioned. He becomes the new leader, and it's his job to lead them into the promised land. Now, you know what jo Joshua does? He does the same thing Moses did 40 years earlier. He's going to send out spies, but he doesn't send 12. He sends two. How did Jesus send people out? Two by two. He sends these two spies, there are two messengers from Joshua, and he handpicks them. They're not voted, they are selected based on their courage and faith. 
And he sent, we know the name of one of them was probably Salmon. We learned in our last study, he's the one who married um, Rahab. And they had a boy named Boaz who married Ruth. So we don't know the name of the other spy. They go and they cross the Jordan River. And when you first read this, and this is in the book of Joshua chapter 2. Now to get through Joshua, I'm going to have to tell you. I'll read you a couple of select verses, but there's a lot of material. When you get into Joshua chapter 2, it says they came and they stayed at the house of Rahab the harlot. And when people first read that, they think, that doesn't look like they're on church ministry. And why did they do that? But they wanted to go where they knew that, first of all, nobody's going to ask questions. They wanted to know where there's a lot of information of what's happening. It, Rahab operated an inn on the wall, and they had a quick way of escape if they needed to, and that's where they could find out, get to intelligence on what's going on in the city. Rahab recognizes that they're Israelites. And when the king comes, because he's heard word that some young men are asking questions, and they have a Hebrew accent, um, he wants to arrest them. She puts her life on the line to protect them. And they make a covenant with her. They say, okay, because you've done this, it'll be our life for your life. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Jesus is my life for your life. They said, but here's the deal. Take this red rope that you're going to use to let us down the window. Hang it in your window. So when we come, when Joshua comes, Joshua's coming. We don't know the day or the hour, but Joshua's coming. And he's going to take possession of this land. Everyone in the house with you with a red rope will be saved. It's interesting, at the beginning of the 40 years, when they left Egypt, everyone in the house with the red blood, all the Jews, were spared. All the firstborn were spared. Now, 40 years later, it's a house with Gentiles, and they must have a symbol of the blood, which is the, um, the red rope. So she makes this covenant with them. And Joshua sends these two messengers. Who are the two messengers Joshua sent to you and me? The word of God, the law and the prophets. These are the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. The Bible tells us the Ten Commandments are written on two tables of stone. It is a sword with how many edges? It is a double-edged sword. The Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. The Bible is often bifurcated into the New and the Old Testament. Like you've got, you know, two eyes to see and two ears to hear and two nostrils to smell, fine dinner. And uh, the Lord only gave us one mouth for a good reason. Gets us into most trouble, right? But uh, so it's a symbol for the word of God. These two messengers sent from Joshua, she receives the messengers, the Bible says, and they are saved as a result of that. And she, everyone in her house is saved. So they make that covenant. Now some time goes by. Rahab's inviting people into her house. In the meantime, God now gives Joshua some very interesting instructions. He says, it is now time for you to cross over. By the way, in the closing message of Joshua, there are three bodies of water that are mentioned. The Hebrews are known as a people. The word Hebrew means from over the river or the one who has crossed over. Did you know that? Uh, based on the name Eber, who was one of the descendants of Noah. And Abraham crossed the Euphrates when he left paganism. When they came out of Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea. When they entered the Promised Land, they crossed the Jordan. Joshua references those three rivers when the children of Israel, in his closing message to the children of Israel, representing their deliverance. God delivers them. The Jordan is a symbol of baptism, and the Jordan is also a symbol of death, burial, and resurrection, which is a type of baptism. He says, I want you to break camp. All the soldiers are to um, muster. Everyone is to get the tabernacle together. All the priests would assemble that. And I want you to get in order. They had traveled so many times. They had this down like clockwork for 40 years. They had been breaking camp and pitching camp and breaking camp and pitching camp. And they start their procession very clean, orderly parade, and the priests go out in front. And contrary to most of the pictures you see, it shows four guys holding the ark. The Bible says the poles of the ark were very long. That's because they had three men on each pole, 12 priests carrying the ark. And they went out in front of the children of Israel, and they came to the Jordan, and Joshua said, God told us to cross over. Well, it's springtime. 
and it's flooding. Now, when they first left uh, Egypt, God had to part the Red Sea before they stepped out. Now he wonders, have you learned anything? And so the priests put their feet in the water. You'll often hear that expression, don't be afraid to put your feet in the water. God does things when you step out in faith. And they put their feet in the water, and the waters started to wall up. Now, when they went through the Red Sea, it walled up on both sides. Now, when they go through the Jordan, it walls up just on the side coming downstream. The rest of it runs off to the Dead Sea. And it's like it hit a big piece of glass, like an aquarium wall. And uh, I always like to imagine that there were fish in the river that were watching all this happen, and were wondering what's going on. And the priests walk off into the middle. The Bible says the Lord dried the ground. So the, he creates this you know, pathway that may be 100 yards wide because there's like 2 million of them. The priests stand there in the middle and all of the nation crosses over. Everybody going from the wilderness to the promised land must pass in review of the ark. What is in the ark? The law of God. The Bible says we will all be judged by the law of liberty. And then James tells us in the same book that the law of liberty is the Ten Commandments. He names two of the Ten Commandments. It's a law of liberty for those who keep it. But the um, Bible says we are all judged according to our works. So they all pass by the ark. And when they get to the other side, and God, it, now I, I, can't, um, I can't help but imagine that the people in Jericho are watching this with great interest. Jericho is not very far away from the Jordan River. They probably saw all the Israelites and all the dust, and they're gathering, and they're heading towards the river. And they thought, what are they going to do? They're going to all drown themselves. Then they saw the river stop, and they're coming over. Do you think the people in Jericho were a little nervous by all of this? They knew that the Israelites said we're coming back for the land that God gave Abraham. So God parts the river, and they pass through. The Bible says when we're baptized, we're sort of going from the wilderness into the a new experience of the Lord, a death, burial, and a resurrection. As soon as they cross then, before the priests come out of the river, Joshua makes an interesting request. God tells them, get 12 strong men to lift a stone out of the riverbed where the water's not running. And they pick up the biggest stones these young guys can carry. And they were masons, some of them in uh, Egypt, so they're probably pretty strong. And they got these big stones, they make an altar of 12 stones. They bring it up the riverbank as a memorial. God said, you know, you're going to forget this miracle is happening. Have you ever been in the middle of a miracle and you're thinking to yourself, I hope I don't ever forget how God has saved me in this situation. We so quickly forget. So he said, I want you to make a memorial because we tend to forget. Heard about a man went to his doctor and he said, doctor, I've got this problem. He says, I just can't remember anything from one minute to the next. The doctor said, well, how long have you had this problem? And said, what problem? <laughs> we tend to forget. Jesus said, Revelation 2, verse 4 and 5, Nevertheless, I have this against you in that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. We tend to forget. In Psalm 119, what does God want us to remember? Look at this. Five different ways that the word of God is spoken of. It says, I will not, Psalm 119, verse 16, I will not forget your word. Psalm 119, verse 83. For I have become like a wineskin in smoke, yet I do not forget your statutes. Verse 93. I will not forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Verse 109. I do not forget your law. Verse 176. I do not forget your commandments. Notice it says your word, your statutes, your precepts, your law, your commandments. All these are all the terms in Psalm 119 talking about the word of God, the law of God. We need to meditate on it. The Bible says day and night, surround ourselves with the word of God because that ends up guiding us in who we become. So after the priests march out of the river, there's a big tsunami of all the water that had, the Bible says that the water backed up all the way to Adam. Now, I don't know where Adam was. It was a town on the river, but it backed up quite a ways. And when the priests came out, all of a sudden that wall of water went swoosh, and there was a big tsunami went down to the Dead Sea. And then as soon as they've crossed over, several things happened. For one thing, the pillar that had led them evaporated. 
Another thing, the next morning, there's no manna. The Bible says it was springtime because it was the time of barley harvest, so they ate the grain that was in the field. Now they've got to, God does not do for them miraculously what they can do for themselves naturally. Some people want God to do a miracle for them when he's given them natural answers. I know people that, um, they say, I know God's going to heal me. I said, have you talked to your doctor about this? Well, I'm not going to a doctor. I believe God's going to heal me. I said, well, you know, they got a procedure that'll fix that. No, no, I'm going to wait for God to heal me. And then they die. Anyone met somebody like that? God wants us to use our brains, use the natural ability. He gave them miracle bread in the wilderness because there was nothing else. God will supply for you sometimes, but he'll wait until you don't have anything else. Then he works a miracle. Now they're in the promised land flowing with milk and honey. There's plenty of food for these people to eat. God says, no more manna. You guys got to go out and get it yourself. And the other thing that happens here, it says they were circumcised because they had not been practicing circumcision from the time of the rebellion 40 years earlier. And now that they're entering the promised land, they renew the covenant. Now it's interesting. When Moses was entering Egypt to be used of God to bring the people out of slavery, there's a really strange uh, experience. You can read about this, Exodus 4, verse 24. Moses is going to talk to Pharaoh to say, let my people go, but before he crosses the Red Sea to go talk to Pharaoh, it says, it came to pass at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Now, when the Bible says God sought to kill him, it doesn't mean God swung at him and he missed. God doesn't miss. God really wants to kill you, he will hit you. It means his life was in jeopardy of being lost. Why? It says, Then Zipporah, his wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son. They had neglected to circumcise one of their sons. And Moses had two sons. God said, Moses, I'm calling you to lead this people in the covenant of Abraham. You know about being circumcised? You circumcise one son, but maybe there was an argument with him and Zipporah. We don't know the backstory. She might have thought it was barbaric, and he's not doing it. And he said, look, how are you going to lead the people in this covenant if you're not practicing it in your own family? That truth should haunt every minister. You ever heard the expression, practice what you preach? It haunts me. It ought to haunt every Christian. If you're going to witness to others about following Jesus, should you follow Jesus? So now they're going in to fight against the pagans. They've crossed the Jordan River, and God says, look, if you want the power of God, you need to renew the covenant. You need to start practicing every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, yes, including circumcision. And all the males were circumcised there at Gilgal. By the way, the word Gilgal means rolling or circle, and that's connected with the word circumcision. It also, it says... They are rolling away the reproach that had come upon Israel because of this. And so they renew the covenant there. And uh, they also keep the Passover. You notice they kept the Passover when they came out of Egypt. Now as they're entering the Promised Land, they're at the Jordan River. They celebrate the sacrifice of the lamb once again. Who does that lamb represent? Jesus. So... I really like this next spot. Now Joshua is getting ready to lead the people as a general against the enemy Canaanites, the Amorites. Here's where Joshua meets Joshua. You read about this here. It says, It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho. He lifted up his eyes, and this is Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. I forget. Some of you are following me. It says he lifted up his eyes and he saw this, this commander, this warlike individual. And he says, are you with us or are you with our enemies? He said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have come. And Joshua says, are you with us or are you against us? Didn't Jesus say, if you're not with me, you're against me? It's almost the same phrase. And he said, take your shoes off your feet. Now, some people say, well, this was Michael the archangel. Are we supposed to worship angels? 
No. And John tried to worship an angel. The angel said, don't do that. Stop it. We do not worship angels. We only worship God. Can you say amen? Does it tell us in Hebrews that the angels worship Jesus? Yeah, so when people tell you Jesus isn't God, the Bible says thou shalt worship the Lord God and him only shall you serve. We are commanded to worship Jesus. Jesus is God. People are always trying to undermine that very important truth. Sometimes the Old Testament has these Christophanies where Christ appears to his people in his pre-incarnation state. He appeared to Abraham, amen? Abraham called him Lord, he's the Lord. He's the one who wrestled with Jacob. Jacob said, I've seen God. And Manoah and his wife, they said, we've seen the Lord, we're gonna die. So Christ would sometimes appear in the Old Testament and here he appears to Joshua who's gonna be leading armies and he appears as the leader of God's army. This is the one who fought with his angels against the dragon in heaven and he won. Michael, Christ. I'm not saying that Michael, that Jesus is an angel. I'm saying Michael is another title for Christ. Sometimes he uh, appears in the Old Testament in that category. And so he falls down, he worships him. At the beginning when God first calls Moses, does God appear to him and say, take your shoes off your feet? Now, does he appear also to Joshua and say, take your shoes off your feet? There was a great deliverance that was about to happen through Moses, and now there's a great deliverance about to happen through Joshua. This small nation, comparatively small nation, is going to conquer these entrenched warlike people. It's going to require a miracle. So Joshua meets Joshua here, and he's got a drawn sword in his hand. What does Jesus use to defeat the enemy? It's the sword. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Jesus appears in Revelation. He's got a sword, a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. I hope everyone knows that's a symbol. When Jesus comes, he's not going to have a big dagger coming out of his head. It's a symbol for the Word of God. So here Michael appears. He's got what? He's got the Word. How do we defeat the enemy? The Word of God. How did Jesus fight temptation? The Word of God. He said to the devil, it is written, it is written, it is written. And man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word. You and I need to fortify our minds with the words and the promises of God. So when we're tempted, thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Can you say amen? amen. If you are easily overcome by temptation, it could be you are not basking in the word. We need to be saturated with the word of God. Make it part of your daily regimen to read the word. The angel's got that sword drawn. So now we move on and we see Joshua again. And this is during the fall of Jericho. And this is the most exciting part. So now Joshua, after this encounter, he says, I'm going to give you victory. Here's the battle plan. No general has ever done this before. I want you to get the whole army and I want you to march them up to the walls of Jericho. Don't say a word, just march boom, boom, boom. And I want you to have seven priests with seven trumpets out in front with the ark and the priests are to continually blow the trumpets. Their puckers must have been sore at the end of that day. They're to blow on these ram horn trumpets. And when you come up to the wall of the city, before you get within firing range, I want you to make a right turn, and then I want you to make a complete circuit around the city of Jericho, those walls that everyone thought were so hard to conquer. Now, what do you think is going on inside the city with the Canaanite soldiers? They're pretty nervous because they saw these men are being fed with heavenly bread. They saw their camp glowing on the other side of the Jordan. They saw the Jordan River part for them. They knew they had defeated the Egyptians. They knew they had defeated Og of Bashan. And they said, these people have got power with them. What are they doing? Now the army, you know, 600,000 men come marching towards them and they take a turn. They go around the city silently marching. Boom, 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 boom. Ground shaking. Trumpets. I do that for effect to wake up anybody who might be sleeping at this part in the sermon. And this is pretty good, isn't it? Like several songs. Anyway, so 
they go around the city, just the trumpets blowing. They're going, what is this? It's some kind of psychological warfare. And they leave. They come back a day later. They march around the city and they leave. And they come back a day. First day they thought maybe they got scared and left. They saw the walls, but now they're back again. And then they're back the third day. How many times did they march around the city? 13 times. Oh, I love that because it always tricks people. They went around the city one time for six days, then seven times on the seventh day. Now when it says the seventh day, it's not talking about the seventh day of the week. People say, Pastor Doug, that doesn't look like very good Sabbath keeping to tell them to go conquer the city and, and kill everybody on the Sabbath day. That wouldn't be very restful. It doesn't mean that's the day they did it. It means there were seven days of marching, the seventh day of sequential marching. They may have started on a Tuesday. But now some of you are thinking, but that still means if they marched seven days sequentially that one of those days was the Sabbath. That's right, and all that was is a Sabbath walk and special music. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. They just walked around the city and came back again. And he's God. Can God do that? Yeah. So, but then that following Wednesday, which was the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times on the seventh day. So far the men have not been allowed to utter a word. Joshua said, don't let a men say a word. Now, what do you think is happening in Rahab's house at this point? Uh, she's having lots of people knock on her door. She said, the only way anyone is going to survive is if they're in my house. You've got to be in the house with a red rope. I have a covenant with Joshua. If you're going to make Joshua's coming. Does Revelation talk about seven trumpets? And so then Joshua gives the signal, and he says, shout. They all stop, and they shout. And those men have been resting their voices, waiting to shout. You got 600,000 men shout. I love to hear a good male choir with, you know, like 80 men. And yeah, it just resonates. And they shouted, and the priest blew the trumpet. Do you know, the loudest noise in modern time, I did an amazing fact on this, that was produced by human means was at the Kansas City game with the Patriots in 2014 when they got the winning touchdown the shout was so loud it was louder than a jumbo 747 taking off produced by human vocal cords and they checked the building later it was so loud people who ran the stadium were afraid it had caused damage and they found seismic damage to the building from the shout of the people. Now I don't think it was the soldiers that brought down the walls. I think it was the angels of God. They all shouted those walls that everyone thought was impenetrable. They fell down flat. They all fell in except one little section of wall because it says Rahab's house was in the wall. It's got a window with a red rope and a lot of very anxious people in that hotel. It's interesting what that house had been used for before. You know what a bordello is. Hope you don't know too much about it. Now it's a church. And those people that were living in a city of destruction are all going to be saved because they're in Rahab's house. Now let me make this really clear. Joshua sent messengers. The messengers received. God has sent his word. We receive it in our upper room. That's where she hid the messengers. There'll be a shout when Jesus comes. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. And the trump of God, will there be a trumpet when Jesus comes? And the Bible says that there is a great earthquake when Jesus comes. Read there in Revelation under the seventh plague. And it says the city of Jericho was burnt with fire. It was given to destruction. That's where Pilgrim's Progress gets the idea that Christian is fleeing from a city of destruction. It would all be burnt with fire. Peter said, the present heavens and earth are kept in store awaiting the judgment of that great day. The elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth and the works therein shall be burned up. The story of Rahab and what happened there is a, it's a symbol of what's coming, friends. Joshua is coming. The trumpets are going to blow. There's going to be a shout. There's going to be a trumpet. There's going to be a resurrection. There's going to be an earthquake. There's going to be a fire. Can you see the story of the second coming in that story? And everybody is destroyed in Jericho except 
The Bible says Rahab and her house are adopted into the family. She becomes a mother in Israel and an ancestor of your Savior. Amen. What an amazing story. You know, Rahab in the Bible is compared to salvation by faith, and she's compared to salvation by works. James says she's an example of works. Hebrews says she's an example of faith. And you find her in chapter 1 of the New Testament as well. Interesting. Well, we're not done with Joshua. Then Joshua has his greatest battle. You know, he makes, he forgives the Gibeonites because they make a covenant with them. That angers all the other nations. The Bible says all the other nations gather against Joshua like the sand on the seashore. And Joshua has to bring Israel. He says, do not be afraid of them. God says, I'm going to give you the victory. All the nations finally come into one massive battle against Joshua. And Joshua prays during that battle, and the sun stands still. He has power over the elements, and the moon stands still. Joshua prays, and the river stops walking. You know what the disciples said about Jesus? Even the elements obey him. Jesus is uh, seen in the story of Joshua. Then finally, before Joshua dies, he lives to 110. You can tell there's more I could share, but I want to get uh, through the message. You know, we are broadcasting on AFTV, and I always like to go off the air and let them get the whole message. Finally, after they're settled in the Promised Land, he leads them all the way in. They gain victory over the enemies. They're resting in the Promised Land. Caleb gets the mountains. Everyone was afraid of fighting the giants, and Caleb gets the land of Hebron, which is where Judea is, and later Jerusalem. Joshua 23, verse 14. Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. Like Moses, God's workers go to their rest, but his work does not stop. Joshua's concerned about the people. And you know in all your hearts and all your soul that not one thing has failed of everything that God has promised you. Not one has failed. All has come to pass. You know, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away. And then verse 15, if it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day who you'll serve. But as for me and my house, what? We will serve the Lord. And Joshua gives that same challenge to you and me. You know, Joshua saw stuff so amazing. You think about it. One of my favorite characters from history is a guy named Patrick Gass. Patrick Gass. Patrick Gass knew George Washington. He knew Thomas Jefferson. He was invited to go on the Lewis and Clark expedition. He was a soldier and he was an expert carpenter from Scottish background. Went all the way from the East Coast to the Pacific Ocean, one of the first people to see it. Came back, continued living, outlived Jefferson and Washington. He knew Daniel Boone. He lived on and he knew Davy Crockett. Knew Abraham Lincoln. When he was in his 90s, he offered to fight in the Civil War. Fought in the War of 1812, lost an eye. Married a gal at about 65, outlived her. Had several children. Can you imagine one person having that much history wrapped up in their life? To see all of that in one lifetime? Think about Joshua. To live as a slave in Egypt to see all those plagues, to live through that wilderness experience, see all those miracles, the provision of God, to see the miracles of victory and going all the way into the promised land. Few people have that experience to know so much. The only one I know who knows all is Jesus. Amen? Amen. Joshua tells us something about our Savior. He can bring us all the way into the promised land. Joshua's story is a story of courage against incredible odds and God wants us to have that courage he can bring us all the way into the promised land do you believe that friends you know we're going to hear that trumpet soon we're going to hear the shout there's going to be a great earthquake I hope you're in the house with the red rope right now that you are under the blood of the lamb amen we're going to sing about that let's stand together we're going to sing about going to the promised land I love this song it's a cheerful song and then we'll close with prayer stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful
Lord, we're so thankful for the witness and the testimony in your word that you can bring us all the way out of the slavery of Egypt into the promised land. I pray everybody here, Lord, will choose today to follow Jesus, our Joshua, to be set free from the captivity of sin. Lord, break the chains and then bring us all the way into the promised land. Help us to have the faith of Joshua that you can finish in our lives what you started. And if you can bring us out, you can bring us all the way in. Lord, we pray that you will part the seas, and the rivers, and move the mountains, do in our lives whatever you need to do. And I pray that we will also surround ourselves with your word and have that courage that we might meet with success and see our Savior face to face. It's in his name we thank you and we 